John, um, my wife Barbara and I have been attending and serving at Arise for about two and a half years now. Uh, I'd like to share with you a testimony of uh, special healing that has happened for me recently. About nine months ago, um, I went to my oncologist for a scheduled appointment to have pictures taken of my lung and they found uh, an area that was of concern to them, but not enough to warrant uh, sending me for treatment. They decided that they were just going to keep an eye on it and uh, take more pictures uh, six months later. And six months later, I went back to the VA for a second round of pictures and it had gotten to the point where they were, they were concerned with it. So they sent me to my oncologist at uh, Moffitt. Um, prior to sending me there, I uh, came up to the altar on Sunday when there was a call for prayer for healing. And uh, I had one of the staff pastors pray with me in a prayer of agreement. Agreeing, believing that I would be healed. Um, that following Friday, I went to Moffitt and they did a setup and they took their own pictures and scheduled my uh, treatments. And uh, the following Monday, the doctor called me at my home. And he said, Mr. Bailey. I said, yes, sir. He said, um, we're going to be canceling your treatment. And I said, well, why would that be? He said, because we can't find anything to treat. And I said, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. And uh, it was kind of quiet on the other end of the phone. I didn't get any response out of him, by the way. Um, and finally, I said, you know, doctor, I thank you for the good news. I hope you have a great day. He said, you too, Mr. Bailey. Uh, you have a good day, and, and I'll, I'll see you later. Or goodbye is what he said, actually. And uh, I thought his response was quite strange because he's been uh, taking care of me for about seven years. And every time I've witnessed to him and praised the Lord and shared my testimony with, with anyone around me, he's been kind of negative about it. But uh, this time, the pause and the silence seemed to uh, be a different attitude on his part. And I found it quite interesting. And I'm just hoping and believing that a seed was planted in that day and that uh, he'll find the Lord one day. My name is John Bailey, and I still believe in miracles. Hey, good morning, risers. How are you guys doing this morning? Welcome. Like four of you are good. How's the rest of you? You believe in the God of miracles? Oh, man, we're going to experience some more miracles this morning. And we've already had miracles this past week. We've seen physical healings. Uh, we saw at least one deliverance at Healing House. Uh, we've seen multiple people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what it's all about right there? God's doing some awesome, awesome stuff. And uh, super, super excited about that. Hey, if you're new to our church... Huh? If you're new to our church, my name is Brent. I get the privilege of being your lead pastor and uh, super excited we get to continue to experience God together today. Hey, um, I, I was just thinking about this. Um, there's a story uh, back in 1995. It kind of became a pop culture legend. You may or may not have actually heard of it, uh, but there's a fellow by, fellow by the name of MacArthur Wheeler. And uh, MacArthur uh, was... Um, well, let's just say, let's just tell you the story. You, you can make your own ideas about him. MacArthur realized that you could make invisible ink with lemon juice. Anybody know you could do that? All right, so you, you can make a vis invisible ink with lemon juice. And so he actually took lemon juice and put it all over his face. He took a Polaroid picture of himself that did not develop for whatever reason uh, correctly, and he could not see his face in the Polaroid picture. Therefore, MacArthur reasoned that my face is invisible. True story, not a joke, true story. And in 1995 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he realized he could make his face invisible and nobody could see him. So in broad daylight with no mask over his face or anything, he robbed two banks at gunpoint. That's MacArthur Wheeler right there. Uh, two banks at gunpoint. Uh, he actually said it was relatively difficult because the lemon juice kept getting in his eyes and it was burning his eyes. And later on that night, they put his picture on the news. The news, you know, puts the word out and people immediately go, oh, I know that guy, right? And so the, the police come and capture him at his house. And uh, because you cannot, I hope you, you can't make your face invisible by putting lemon juice on it. it might make it break out, I don't know. This actually led to this interesting study that became known as the Dunning-Kruger effect that kind of came out of this. He became kind of the, the, the story of it in a lot of regards. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect basically says that those who know the least are oftentimes the most confident that they know the most. 
Let that sink in. Uh, go, go to that next slide, George, will you? Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. And so you can see it right here. So the confidence of those who know nothing is very high. I do find it ironically that it says know nothing on the bottom left-hand corner. Some of y'all get that. Ask your, yeah. No, I'm, I thought that was funny. I, I stole this. I didn't make this. Um, but those who know nothing, K-N-O-W, are oftentimes the highest on confidence that they actually know something. Anybody have any teenagers? <laughs> Just pointing out there might be other evidence other than MacArthur. So those who are, I mean, they're very confident. And then with life experience and knowledge in the field of what you would know, it actually dips to, for most of us in most fields, we realize we don't really know that much about it, right? You can put an algebra problem in front of me now, and maybe in high school I can answer it, but now I am lost like a ghost in the fog. I realize I don't know all that much about it because uh, I know. So, so for most of us, hopefully we're in that place that somewhere in the middle where we realize we don't know that much. We're not that confident with it. And then when you do actually become an expert expert in a field, it goes back up and goes fairly high, but it never actually goes as high as those who don't know anything. <coughs> Isn't that a wild study? Could it be, I wonder, sometimes in the church world, I was just thinking, could it be sometimes that the Dunning-Kruger effect could actually hit you and I because we come to contact with Christ. We know something about Christ. We, we have a general idea about the Bible and the Word of God and revelations from the Word and the Holy Spirit in our life. And we have a general idea about it, but we get to a place that we think we know everything. Bless God. I know Jesus. I know the cross. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know, I know, I know, not realizing how ignorant the very fact that we would say that is because God's grace and revelations are so far beyond us that you actually don't know them. You know a sliver of them. Are you with me? And I wonder if the Dunning-Kruger effect couldn't actually hit us sometimes. I wonder, do you know how little you know? <laughs> it's a good opportunity. Just say that to your spouse real fast. Do you know how little you know? How little you know? Some of you have been waiting to say that for a long time and I just gave you permission. Do you know how little you know. You know, sometimes, oftentimes, things that we think are impossible, this is, it cannot happen, are actually found out to not only be possible, but common or frequent. I, I was riding, um, some of y'all might've seen this on social media, but I was, uh, I rode my bike to the office for the first time this week, and I'm trying to create this habit of riding my bike. Ada laughs at me, but I'm doing it anyway. And so I rode my bike to the office and, um, and I'm riding and my pace, and I had some red lights and things like that, but my pace was like five minute, 15 second miles or something like that, which is like a brisk bike ride. And I was thinking as my phone's giving me these alerts telling me, you know, how, what my pace is, I was thinking about the four minute mile. If you go back, you know, uh, I don't know what it'd be now, 70, 80 years ago, uh, people literally believed that it was humanly impossible to run faster than four minutes in a mile. And I've never really thought a lot about that until I'm riding my bike at a pace of five minutes and 15 seconds a mile. And I'm thinking, this is pretty fast. Like, I mean, I'm not like blazing, but it's, it's a good solid pace. And I'm like, people are going to run a mile, a minute and 15 second pace faster than I'm riding right now. Like if I were running beside my bike, it's not a sprint, but it's pretty close. I don't think I could, I don't think I could run a four minute mile if I sprinted the entire mile, which didn't about to happen, but I don't. And so for years, they thought it was humanly impossible. People would get four minutes and three seconds, four minutes and five seconds, four minutes and six seconds. All the, it was humanly impossible to actually run a four minute mile until it's broken. And once it was broken and we revealed what we knew that it actually was not true, all that truth that we had got thrown out of the window and you found that year after year after year after year, the four minute mile got broken over and over and over and over again. I wonder how many things in our life, we know it to be true until we find out it's not true. And then we keep finding out it's deeper than that in the untruth. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get there if you're not there yet, we'll get there. So we need to learn, I believe, to live on the edge of our ignorance. We need to learn to live on the edge of our ignorance incompetence. You know, kids do this and that's why kids are always growing. You know, they, they start out and they're, they're doing basic math and subtraction and that leads into multiplication and division and, 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 and fractions and all these things that lead into pre-algebra and then algebra and, and, and then trigonometry later on and all these things. And you, kids naturally because of schooling are forced to live on the edge of their ignorance. They're always going a step beyond that, right? What happens to us when we graduate? 
whether that mean high school or college or whatever that graduation date was for you. But oftentimes when we graduate, we actually stop learning and we start thinking we know it all because of what we have already learned. Is this too deep, too quick? And so we, we, we stop learning and just thinking about, we need to learn to live on the edge of our ignorance. We need to keep pushing ourselves to become, uh, have deeper revelations of God, but also deeper understandings of God and, and, and understand the word of God better. Because the second we think we know it all, we become part of that uh, Kruger effect. And all of a sudden now we might be the most dumb person in the room because we think we know it. Let that sink in. Talking to me too. All right. So thinking about this, I was thinking out what causes a person to go beyond the horizon? You ever think like, I, I know like Christopher Columbus is almost like a bad word nowadays in America, but uh, he's the first one to sail across the new world in the modern context, the modern sense. And Christopher Columbus gets on a boat, not really knowing what's on the other side of the horizon, having an idea maybe, but that is it. He gets on a boat. What actually captivates a person to go beyond the safety of the shore, beyond the sh safety of their own understanding, to go beyond the horizon and explore what's on the other side? <coughs> What would cause a man to do that? I think of Lewis and Clark. What would cause Lewis and Clark to say, I got to go across these hills and across these prairies and across these valleys, and I'm going to see what's on the other side. What causes a person to stretch themselves beyond the safety of their shore, beyond the safety of what they know, and actually go into deeper things and explore and become a pioneer? What causes a person to do that? What, what, what would cause a person to go to the depths of the ocean in order to explore it? Aiden and I were watching a documentary a few weeks ago on the Andes Mountains in South America, and there was a, a man who was trekking the mountains, and they asked him, they said, why do you keep going over mountains? He said, because every time I go over a mountain, I see another mountain, and I wonder, what's on the other side of that mountain? And then I go over that one, and then I wonder, what's on? The Andes Mountains is a long chain, y'all. And so he's been trekking for a long period of time, these Andes Mountains, because he always has this curiosity, what's on the other side? What would cause us to want to put a man on the moon? What would cause us to do things that seem impossible? You know, it's like space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Star Trek and Starship Enterprise. It's a five-year mission to explore, explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations. Listen, to boldly go where no man has gone before. What causes a person to boldly go where no man has gone before? Because it's very safe to go where men have gone before. I know that area. I know, why would I go settle and go, go, go pioneer something new when I know what is safe in my comfort zone? Which actually causes us to live in such a place that we stop experiencing the excitement of the new. We stop exploring. We stop uh, 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 taking our horizons and broadening them because we get comfortable living in the safety of what we've known. What if there's more than what we're experiencing. <coughs> what if there's more to this Christian thing? What if there's, what if there's more of, to, to, to God than what we actually know? What if we suffer a little bit from the Dunning-Kruger effect where we think we know everything, which shows actually how little bit we know? H have we become so accustomed to the ordinary that we stopped hungering for the extraordinary? Can we get to a place that we think we know how God's going to move and so we put him inside of a box of our own understanding and expect him to move that way? I really have one big question I want to ask you this morning and feed into it. It's an unusual type of message. I'm going to tell you a lot of stories and such, but one big question I want to ask you this morning is this. Are you hungry for more? I know it's 9 a.m. and I know some of you didn't get enough coffee yet, but are you hungry for more? Are you wanting to stretch your horizons? Are you wanting to go over the safety of the shore and into the horizon of what God has for you? Or have you become accustomed to your daily habits and disciplines and all those things that might be well and good, but they aren't stretching you to actually experience everything that God has for you? Are you hungry for more? What if there's more? What if, what if there is? Would you be willing to pay the price to actually seek it out? If God had a greater measure of grace for you, greater miracles in your hands, it's not enough just to know it. You're going to have to act on it. Would you be willing to pay the price to actually explore the great unknown, what Stephen Curtis Chapman would call the great adventure? Would you be willing to pay that price? See, mysteries and revelations and the deep things of God are only given to those who seek after them. 
Paul wrote in Ephesians, and, and he's writing here, it's an interesting book. Most of the letters that Paul wrote were all about an issue going on that he needed to correct. So he's always like, you know, stop doing this, stop doing that. And he's always correcting and rebuking and all this. Ephesians is an interesting letter because he's not actually writing Ephesians to correct a heresy or problem inside of the church. He's actually writing the book of Ephesians to broaden their minds about the grace of God. Hmm. And in Ephesians chapter three, this, this early church planter, Paul, he's writing and he says this three, eight and nine, can you throw that up, George? It says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. There's, there's a mystery out there. There, there. There's a mystery out there that you need to solve. There, there, there's a challenge out there that you need to go after and tackle and wrestle to the ground. Administrations of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. So Paul says, there is a mystery in God. There are things that are hidden in God and I get to be like a pirate hunter. I get to be like a treasure hunter looking for what God has hidden for only those who are willing to actually stretch themselves to find it. Did you know there are deep things of God? Did you know there are powerful revelations of God that are only set aside for those who are willing to stretch themselves to find it? It's good that you can come and hear a sermon or that you can go on YouTube and watch a sermon or what have you. That's, that's all fine and good. And you get secondhand revelation from some pastor or some teacher or leader who found it themselves. But there's something far greater than that. And that is when you receive the revelation yourself because you're stretching yourself deeper. There's a revelation reserved only for those who are willing to seek it. There might be more on the horizon for you than you really realize. So is there a hunger for more. Is there a hunger for more? The fact the room is this quiet right now tells me that this message is important. <laughs> because I wanna preach to a church, I wanna experience a church, I wanna be a part of a move of God where people are desperately hungry for God. And, and my goal this morning is to relaunch and reawaken a hunger inside of us. See, if you're taking notes, hunger is a sign of physical health. <coughs> We know this, it's fairly obvious. If you have a child and the child decides they're not eating anymore, especially when they're younger and they can't describe to you what's the problem, you know that something's wrong. Child should be eating. If you have a teenager boy and they stop eating, you know something is really wrong. Come on, somebody. It might be like, he might be heartbroken. I mean, something was seriously wrong. Because hunger is a sign of physical health. And uh, interesting things about hunger start to happen when we look at this. You know, if you go long enough without eating physically, you actually start to lose your appetite. It's a weird phenomenon that happens. Anybody ever fasted, you know, more than three, four, five days, anything past that? At some point in that process, you actually start losing your appetite. You lose your hunger. You're not hungry. So get this. At the same moment that you are starving, physically starving, like not just like I'm starving. No, I mean, you physically are starving your body. At the same moment you are starving, your body stops craving the very nourishment that it needs. Isn't that a weird phenomenon? It's very strange. Some of you are like, that happens. Just fast for longer than three or four days. Somewhere in there, you're gonna see it. You get up, you, you, you just, you're not hungry anymore. Isn't that weird? So, so the very thing you need, you no longer have a hunger for it. Is that not a picture of the world that we live in? That spiritually speaking, they are starving to death, but because they have fasted without the Lord for so long, they no longer even realize they have a need for the Lord. Meanwhile, they're dying without the Lord. You know how you fix that problem when you're fasting? It, it kind of works in, in multiple ways. One, if you start eating, the first time you take a bite, that hunger comes right back. And again, if you fasted, you know what I'm talking about. You eat one French fry, you eat one bite of chicken. That, that's why you don't break that fast after four days because it is not worth it to have one little thing because it's gonna mess, you gotta start all over with the appetite thing. So, so you eat one little thing and all of a sudden now, you, 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 that hunger comes right back. That, that's why some of you, you, you haven't been to church in years. You walk into the church world and all of a sudden you come back alive and you're like, I'm so hungry for this. It's been so long and you weren't hungry a week ago but now you stepped into an environment where food was being served. You, you know when else it can be hard, depending on your tolerance for food? When you smell it. 
I'm okay with looking at it, man. I can, I can look at Pizza Hut commercials, not really that much of a bother. I can, I can watch the you know, Olive Garden commercials and, and all that kind of stuff. I can do all that and it doesn't bother me so much. But you put me in the environment where I smell it and all of a sudden I'm like, mm, I, I need some of that. It reawakens the hunger all over again. What, what environments are you creating around you? Because when the church of Jesus Christ becomes content and not hungry any longer, when we're not actually creating the environment that fosters the hunger of God, the world will not be hungry for it. Are y'all with me? See, see hunger is a physical, when you're, when you're not hungry, it's a physical problem, but it goes deeper than that. And your atmosphere cre- creates your appetite. And if you're in an atmosphere where you smell the goodness of God, where you sense the goodness of God there, it reawakens that appetite that might be in somebody. Some, some of you are shaking your head yes because you've experienced this because you can go years without going to church and, and you were far away from God and you walked away from him and all of a sudden you're in the environment of somebody who is genuinely hungry for God and genuinely loves Jesus and something inside of you awakens and you're like, oh, I miss that. I want that. You didn't miss it before you were in their environment. Reawakens, reawakens. And the healthy Christian is gonna be an interesting phenomenon because, because when you are physically hungry, <coughs> when you're physically hungry, you eat and then you're full. We're about to hit Thanksgiving. Some of us are going to eat so much you cannot eat anymore because that's how we celebrate being thankful in America. <laughs> so when you're physically hungry, you eat and then you are not physically hungry any longer. Spiritually speaking, there's a different thing that happens. In fact, point number two, hunger is a sign of spiritual health. Spiritually speaking, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. That's why fasting works that way, I believe. The more you eat, the hungrier you actually become. The more you experience God, the more you want to experience God. The more you worship, the more you want to worship. The more you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, the more you want to speak in tongues. The more you spend time in God's presence, the more time you want to spend in God's presence. Because when you receive one revelation, you want another. When you get one mystery, you want another. When you understand the kingdom on one level, you want to take it even deeper. And the healthy Christian is a lifestyle of being both full of God and being hungry for more of God, which is, which is opposite when we talk about physically. So a healthy Christian will always be a hungry Christian. And if you came in this morning and you're not hungry for more of God, you're not healthy. <laughs> Y'all can write that down and tweet it. <laughs> a healthy Christian will always be a hungry Christian. See, hunger motivates people to move beyond their convenience. Hunger. When you're really hungry, I mean, like if you're really starving, all of a sudden you will fight to get out of your convenient models. Hungry people will steal when they would never have stolen before. Hungry people will move outside of what seems safe because, because they're hungry and they get desperate. They get, they get desperate. Hungry, hunger makes you leave the safety of the shore. It causes people to think differently. It causes people to move differently. Hunger will cause you to stop playing church and actually be the church. Hunger will cause you to come up in the front and go crazy for Jesus when, and you don't care what anybody thinks anymore. Hunger will cause you to witness to your doctor when not caring what the doctor actually is gonna reply back to you in an ugly way. Hunger will cause you to be a light for Jesus everywhere you are, not caring what anybody else thinks. That's what hunger will do. Because hungry people are desperate for more of God. Hungry people are desperate people. And, and, and a hunger... A hunger for more of God is actually what birthed our movement. This is the story of Pentecost. This is the story of the Assemblies of God and the, the story of the modern world that, that there was a, a Methodist movement that was started and John Wesley was the great Methodist evangelist and, and apostle to the Methodists and taught them a style of church. And somewhere along the line, they started to believe in the second work of grace. We could talk all about what that probably was and that's another time. But these Methodists got hungry for more of God because for the first time, John Wesley was saying, there's something beyond salvation. There's something else you can experience. And these Methodists thought, if there's something else I can experience, I want it. If there's something else you can experience, do you want it? I'm glad five of you do. How about the rest of you? Are you hungry for what God has for you? 
And out of this Methodist experience, they said there's a second work of grace. So I'm going to strive and, and I want to experience what God has for me. I want to know the revelation and the mysteries. What is that second work of grace? And as people are striving for that, uh, to experience that, they actually start speaking in tongues. And all of this is weird at the time and crazy. But it's literally the hunger for more that sparked the Pentecostal movement. You go back to William Seymour and, and this, this, this one-eyed African-American preacher who was the son of former slaves who, who had nothing going for him. He goes to California because he's supposedly supposed to be able to, 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 to start a, or work in a church there. They're going to hire him as the pastor. But he goes in and he starts talking about this belief he had of speaking in tongues. And people thought, you are crazy. They fired him on his opening Sunday. That's worse than Willie Taggart, y'all. <clears throat> okay. Um, they, they, they let him go immediately. They said, I don't believe in this theology. You can't be a part of this theology. This is not it. And so, so, so they let him go immediately. He just moved his whole self to California. So he started meeting in what they now call the Bonnie Bray house and people were hungry for God. And so they came together. And when you're hungry, it's a weird thing that happens because you will physically fast when you're spiritually hungry. It's weird how these dynamics work. And they called a 10 day fast. And out of that 10 day fast, revival started to break out inside of this house they called the Bonnie Bray house. In fact, there's all kinds of stories of what God was doing and people started speaking in tongues and radical things started happening. And, 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 and as they come together, there were actually so many people at Bonnie Bray house that the front porch collapsed under the weight of the people. And they said, we got to do something about this. So they decided to rent out a church and to buy another church somewhere. And they, they looked around and there was a, an up, a church that didn't want to be in the bad part of town anymore. And so they decided we didn't want this building anymore. We're going to build a new building on the nice side of town. And so in the, in the warehouse district, in the industrial district of Los Angeles at the time, they, they, they rented out this, this uh, uh, facility here at 312 Azusa Street, which became known as the Azusa Street Revival where people were hungry for God and people started to flock from all over. In fact, they say from 10 a.m. To, to about midnight every day, there were services going on. They weren't services like we experienced so much. It wasn't always just a preacher. There was people encountering the presence of God everywhere they went and radical things were going on. I've heard one story of a woman who spoke in eight different languages when she was given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've heard of people who literally, during that time, they literally sat down at a keyboard and immediately started playing a piano they'd never learned before. God was moving in radical ways. There, 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 there's accounts of multiple times where the uh, fire department was called out by the city officials and different people that would see the building because they literally saw a fire on top of the building. But when the fire, showed, fire department showed up, there was not a literal fire, there was a spiritual fire going on. <clears throat> and William Seymour, who was not even allowed to get a theological education because he was black and had to sit outside of the rooms in Texas and listen through the door jam, the least likely person to lead this is exactly the person that God raises up to lead the movement that started the, Pentec the modern Pentecostal church. And healings and miracles were commonplace. It was normal. It wasn't anything wild. It was just the way it was. I heard of one story of a man who came from another country to criticize the revival because it had gotten so widespread and they showed up from this other country and they're criticizing the revival in their native language and God gives somebody the words or, or gives somebody the tongue of that language and they don't even know what they're saying and they're rebutting everything the man says in his language. Could there be more than what you're experiencing? That's all I'm asking. Could there be more? Could there be more than what I'm experiencing? An estimated 50,000 people attended the, not just attended, but received the baptism of the Holy Spirit during the Azusa Street Revival's time. And those 50,000 people then went all around the world, all over the United States and around the world, and they planted Pentecostal churches, which all these years later, we are part of the root system of that movement. But what started the movement was a hunger for more. And as soon as we lose our hunger for more, we lose the movement. And then we become a shell of what Azusa Street was and not the actual movement of what Azusa Street was. You see, revival happens when people get hungry for God. God moves when people get hungry for him. Our hunger pulls on God's presence. Our hunger pulls on God's presence. So if I could, I just wanna, I just wanna tell you some testimonies because number three, testimonies feed our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's not just the Bible alone. That's also testimonies. 
And so, so when I want to create a passion inside of myself, I expose myself to testimonies and stories and books and, and all kinds of things like that that will feed my faith. It creates extra hunger in me. Why? Because the more I eat, the hungrier I get. And so I expose myself to that. And hunger is contagious. If you're around hungry people, you'll become hungry yourself. So I just want to spend the rest of the time talking about what could be and telling some stories. So, so let me just start with a couple Bible stories. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Paul's writing and he says this, and I'm going to skip through a little bit, but I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Just, just stop there for a second. When's the last time you had a vision from God? What if God wants to give you a vision today? What if God wants to give you a vision tonight? What if God wants you to show up at Restoration Room this month and receive a vision from him? What if God wants you to spend some time in prayer separate from everybody else and he will download visions and revelations? It's not just for Paul because he's the apostle. It's for you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. <coughs> I knew a man who was in Christ. He's talking about himself in third person. He's like a professional athlete. <laughs> I know a man who was in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. That, that, that's like the heavenlies. That's like, that's like what you and I would call heaven. That's what the third heaven would be right there. So he's caught up into heaven. This isn't some weird guy writing a book. This is the apostle Paul. What if God called you up and showed you great revelations and deep things of the Lord? Whether it's in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, talking about himself, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. What if God wanted to take you deeper? What if God wanted to show you revelations and give you visions and show you deep things of Christ? What if God wanted to call you higher? What if? What if? How about Acts chapter 5? How about this? Acts chapter 5. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. Just stop there for a second. We need signs and wonders in our midst. We don't focus on signs and wonders. We focus on God. But when you chase God, signs and wonders follow. And the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them. Or even, uh, uh, even though they were uh, highly regarded by the people, people were literally scared to come to church because God's power was so strong. When's the last time that happened? <laughs> Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of, their, some of them as they passed by. Could it, like, like what if, what if? I know this is crazy, I know this is outlandish, but what if the person in the cubicle got healed next to you because you were next to them? What if? I just wanna stretch our imagination a little bit. Your imagination is God's playground. That's why it needs to be sanctified and full of the word of God so that God can show you the deeper things. What if amazing things wanted to happen that might not even be on your radar right now because we have the Dunning-Kruger effect and we think we know it all. I know how God, I know how I have to pray for somebody. What if he wanted to use you in a different way? Crowds gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And all of them, all of them, all of them were healed. I know we have theology that says sometimes people aren't healed. I understand that. I agree with that. I know there are different reasons and different things and blah, blah, blah. I, but what if God just wanted to heal everybody despite my theology? I don't know. What if God wanted to say cancer be gone and leukemia dis disappear? What if God wanted to heal everybody? I have a friend named Clayton King. Clayton King was in uh, Zangalar, Tibet a number of years ago, well, not too long ago now, probably 10 years ago, he was in uh, Tibet working with some Buddhists there in an area where they literally killed Christians all the time. In fact, a, a group had come in with like a couple dozen Bibles and they had killed them for having Bibles. Meanwhile, Clayton comes in with his team that has hundreds of Bibles to give away. And uh, so, so there's this tension that's there and this really cool long story I don't have time to get into, but they're doing some medical missions 50 miles outside of any real town. So they've trekked 50 miles through the mountains to get to this place in Tibet, right outside of Nepal in India. They trekked 50 miles to get there. And as they get there, they said, they said, you know, what do we need? What do you need? So they're working and helping people. This lady comes in and she says, hey, we're, we're delivering a baby. We need a doctor who can deliver a baby. Clayton, can you deliver a doctor? And Clayton says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but I cannot deliver a baby. <laughs> <coughs> 
But he said, I know somebody who can because they actually had a doctor with them on the trip. And so they go into this tent and this woman is in hard, painful labor. And the Buddhists are all around touching her on the head and doing different incantations and all these different things going on in this mixture of Buddhism and Hinduism that would be there in Tibet. And they're doing all these incantations and stuff. And this woman is in deep, deep pain. And the, the doctor's feeling her stomach and working with her and all this that's going on. And the doctor finally says, okay, we got a problem. Says to Clayton, said, you better pray said, these babies are breached. He said, first of all, babies with an S? Said, yes, there's two of them and they are breached and we ain't in a hospital and we got an issue. So they continue praying and Clayton's praying. Now, mind you, this is a place they kill Christians. And Clayton actually in the middle of praying through the interpreter, he says, tell them this. He said, okay, we'll tell them. He said, tell them that God is going, that God sent us here as American missionaries. He said, well, God sent us here as American missionaries. He said, tell them that we're gonna, our God is gonna show how much greater he is than your God. And they said, okay. And he said, tell them that, that when these babies are born, they're gonna be born healthy. And if they're, not, if they're not born healthy, you can kill us. The interpreter said, you say, you say kill us? You, you, you say kill us? So through some fighting, the interpreter finally interprets that. So you can kill us if these babies are not born healthy. A few minutes later, the lady who's the doctor looks up at Clayton and said, you better have heard from God. <clears throat> because there seems to be some complications with this birth. And they get the first baby out and the first baby's fine. Seems good. They pull the second baby out and the baby is cold. Has been dead for hours. Not alive. This is a doctor in that little room. The entire village is, you know, small villages. The entire village is crowded around the house, looking in the windows, watching what's going on, waiting for anticipation to see what's gonna happen. The entire village is there and the baby comes out and the baby's already cold and, and, and shades of blue and all that that would be there. And the baby is born that way. And Clayton, not knowing anything else to do, what would you do in this situation? Starts crying out to God going, God, you gotta show up in this situation or we're gonna die as martyrs here in this Tibetan village. God, you gotta show up. And they started crying out to God. And as sure as I'm standing here, that baby coughed and started breathing and came back to life in that room. <clears throat> what if God wants to stretch our imaginations? Shane Willard's an evangelist friend of mine. Shane was in, a, 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 what's the name of the country I have it written down? Shane was in, um, Fiji in 2004 and he was working with some Hindu people there in Fiji and they had a bookshelf of gods and he's talking to this this Hindu priest and he says listen he said he said our God is greater than all of your gods and he's trying to describe it he's going Jesus isn't the God you put on the bottom shelf Jesus is the God of God you put him on the top shelf and he's sharing all these ideas with him and the man spoke back and he said well here's the deal he said he said the gods of my country, the Hindu gods made my son mute. They cursed him with muteness. If your God can deliver him from that muteness, then I'll believe in your God. Shane said, well, bring him on. At the exact same moment, he is shaking in his boots. He said, my God will heal your son. He said, they went to get his son, took him a few minutes. They had to go find him and get him, get him into the house kind of thing. He said, he is shaking in his boots the whole time. The whole time in his, in his outward, he looks like he's got it together. Anybody know what this looks like? On the inward, he's going, God, please show up, please show up, please show up. I just put you on, a, God, please show up, please show up. But on the outside, he acts like he's confident, right? So the son finally starts to walk into the house. He walks into the house. Shane, shaking in his boots, walks into the house. Nobody laid hands on him. Nobody touched him. He fell down under the power of God. And when he got back up, the first words he said was, Jesus is God. <laughs> What if there's more? What if there's more than just coming to church on Sunday morning and Wednesday night occasionally? What if there's more than showing up whenever you, it's convenient? What if there's more? Smith Wigglesworth was one of the great healing evangelists, kind of, kind of crazy and, and wild and extreme in his, his approach, but man, it worked a lot of times. In fact, he was dying from an appendicitis and a minister climbed over him and punched him in the side and cursed the, the demon that was in him is what he said. And he literally was instantly healed. And so he took that approach forever after that. But, but radical healings that happened under Smith Wigglesworth's ministry. In fact, one time they said a man who had nubs for feet, his feet had been crushed off and he had nubs for feet. 
And, and Smith said, go buy shoes. And the man's like, I don't need to buy shoes. I ain't got any money, first of all. I don't need to buy shoes. I don't have feet that would fit the shoes. It's pointless to buy shoes. But he went, and, after hesitating, he went and bought shoes, came back to the revival the next night. And Smith put the shoes on his feet. And when he put the shoes on his feet, his feet began to grow out into the shoes. Listen, I know some of you are way too intellectual to believe that. But what if? What if God really works in miracles today? What if great things are still being done? Smith Wigglesworth is said to be on, on, on trains and people around him would be convicted by the Holy Spirit because it was on him so strongly. Uh, multiple times women and people would come in with crutches and they would be physically healed and lame legs that hadn't walked in, in dozens of years that were shriveled up would be completely restored and he would, they would walk out fine. It's not about Smith Wigglesworth. It's about the power of God that lives in us. Have we gotten so comfortable with the shore of our safety that we refuse to step out into the more that God has for us? My friend, Dean Nifferatus, was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and, and this and that. And he's in an elevator one time in, 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 a, in a country and, and he's in the elevator and the Holy Spirit just came on him and he began speaking in tongues in the elevator. Now, this is a friend of mine. Dean literally led the man to Jesus in a language he did not understand. Listen, I know you can't believe this stuff, but what if? What if there's revelations and mysteries and amazing things out there that are so much greater than we've experienced and we've settled thinking we know it all when God has something so much greater? What if? I think of Reese Howells and the, the Welsh revival that was a mighty move of God that in some ways touched the Azusa Street revival and was a preemptive revival to Azusa Street. And you, most of you probably never heard of Reese Howells. All of these people from the Welsh revival are getting saved and, and wanting to go into ministry, but nobody knew how to pray. So Reese said, I'm going to start a school that just teaches you how to pray. And the stories go that during World War II, that him and his prayer team would be together praying and God would give them open visions of battles going on. And they would pray over those battles and God would reveal to them how to pray over those battles. And then two days later over the news and over the radio, that was the common message of the time, uh, over, that, over the radio, they would hear that the battle played out exactly the way that they had prayed. <coughs> Listen, I'm not taken away from I'm not taking away from our soldiers who did the work of the battle, but maybe there was a spiritual battle also going on in the heavens. Maybe there was something a little bit more, something a little bit deeper. And maybe we're so physical that we can't see the spiritual. Maybe we know it all so much that you can't see what's right in front of us. <laughs> We could talk about the Jesus movement and how it hit cities and it started to change lives all over the place and, and hundreds of thousands of hippies started coming to Christ and then the church didn't even know what to do with them because the revival that spread across North America was so powerful. We could talk about Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Simple McPherson. We could talk about John G. Lake, who they say had 100,000 documented healings under his ministry. 100,000. We could talk about these people. And all I want to do, though, is say maybe there's more than what I'm experiencing. Maybe I shouldn't be so happy with just the way things are. Maybe there should be something inside of me that's chasing and reaching and longing for more. Maybe we need a God chaser mentality in our church again that says there's, there's a hunger that exceeds our grasp for God and we're going after him. For, for hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but hundreds of years before that, Spain had a, had a motto. It was ne plus ultra, no more beyond because they believed they had conquered the world. They believed they had known the world. It was nay plus ultra, no more beyond. And if you go to this day in the hometown of Columbus in Spain, you'll see this statue and there's not a great picture of it here, but you'll see the statue. And it's a powerful statue because that nay plus ultra, the nay part is getting eaten by the lion in the statue. In other words, no more beyond, rip out the no, and now you have more beyond. What God sent me here to do this morning is to tell you there is more beyond. Take out the no. Remove the no. What if God wants to do more through you than you have imagined? What if God wants to stretch your imagination to actually meet up with who he is? Come on, stand up with me, church. Are you hungry? Are you hungry?
<laughs> oh, what if God wants to show you more? What if revival is one step away? What if God wants to shut down every psychic office in Brandon? What if God wants to bring healing to all those in the hospital? What if God wants your love to be the hands and feet that pulls people out of hatred? What if God wants to do more than you can imagine? What if God wants to reveal mysteries to you? What if God wants to give you dreams? What if God wants to give you words for people in the grocery store? What if God wants to use your hands to heal people? What if there's more than we're experiencing? Come on, church. Come on, come on. Are you hungry for more? Come on, go after him for a few minutes. Go after him. I'm not satisfied. I want more of you, Lord. In heaven, come down. Spirit, break out. In spirit, break out. Oh, break out in this place. And break our walls down. Oh, we want you now, God. In spirit, break out. We purposely wanted to end this way. If our prayer team could go ahead and come on up here. If you are hungry for more, if you will be humble enough to admit as I do that I have lost my hunger and I need God to reawaken a hunger inside of me. I become, I become confident in what I know, which probably shows me how little I know. The Dunning-Kruger effect is alive in my life. If you're like me and you say, I just want more of God. I'm just hungry. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care if I gotta leave my husband or my wife at this chair. I want more of God. I want you to begin coming down and we're just gonna worship and go after God for a minute. And this prayer team is going to be anointed to lay hands on you and see revival happen in your life and reawaken a hunger in your life because we're hungry for more. Crying out to God, make me hungry again. Come on, church. Yeah. Our Father, and come all on, come of on. heaven wrote your name, sing louder. I want to be full while I'm and also hungry. Hunger is your gateway to revival. Oh, yes. The sound of heaven. Hunger is your gateway to revival. Revival is all of heaven. Lord, your name. Sing louder. Let this place erupt with praise. Can you hear it? God, we cry out there. The sound of heaven. The sound of heaven touching earth and spirit break out and break our walls down. Spirit, spirit break out. Oh, we need you now, God. In heaven. Name we're lifting high, Lord, Lord.